that's my thumb. <laughs> okay, I would like to do the best I can in talking about the subject of forgiveness. Um, I'd like to share an example with you of the forgiveness of an unrepentant wicked man, what it looks like. You see, I think when our moral leaders who, whether they know better or not, we'll leave that up to God, but our moral leaders who preach free, unconditional forgiveness and who instruct victims of abuse who may have suffered abuse at the hands of, say, their parents or children or spouse, they will exhort these victims to forgive their abusers. And they leave the impression, at least they did on me, in fact, I might add, I felt this pressure even when I wasn't verbally told these things, but whether it's explicitly communicated or you just sense it. When we were told or pressured to forgive the ones who abused us and treated us wickedly, that we were somehow or other under compunction to reconcile with them, to live in harmony with them, to be the, the bigger person and be an example for them. <clears throat> you know, I love John Gill and his commentary. I quote him practically every single video I do, and I will continue to do so. I think he's the greatest theologian that I've ever encountered. He was Charles Spurgeon's pastor. He's the only man who, in history, He's the only one who wrote an exposition of the entire Bible. It took him his entire life to do it. But I read the other day, even he, even John Gill wrote that the loving wife, if she's in a bond with a, an evil, wicked husband, should strive to be an example for him. And my heart sank. This doctrine has got to go. <laughs> it's not in the Bible. Not when we're dealing with reprobates, it's not. Let me share an example with you of what I'm talking about, what is true scriptural forgiveness that we are to exercise toward the unrepentant wicked. Back to recon let me see if I can pronounce this reconciliatory type forgiveness the forgiveness that does involve reconciliation we are we we have been told by god to reconcile with those who genuinely repent of their evil ways toward us but 
But I'll tell you right now, a malignant narcissist not only will never repent, they can't. It's not in them. It's not in them. There is no reconciliation with the wicked. I don't care if he's your so-called husband, so-called parent, so-called child, wife, mother, mo mother-in-law. It's true. Again, I'm talking about wicked people, not people like us sinners. We, we, I mean, every one of us sin. And, and if you think you don't, I have actually heard pre preachers say that they've gone so many weeks without sinning. That's almost blasphemous. You put our righteousness up against the holiness of of the Creator <laughs> and you'll realize yeah we we sin every second I'm talking about wickedness men who are actively opposed to God actively opposed to the conscience of God's children men who practice iniquity, men who delight and enjoy hurting other people, the wicked, they don't repent. Even modern psychotherapy uh, confirms what I'm telling you. Even psychology recognizes that narcissism, that there is no cure. I'll use that expression. There is no cure for narcissism. It is a fixed condition of the soul and of the spirit. They don't repent. But if someone has acted sinfully towards you or me or wrongly if someone has wrongfully treated you and empaths can wrongfully treat each other yes we can oh yeah but we still have the capacity to to mend our ways and to recognize yes we even we, we we recognize that was wrong that was stupid of me that was wrong i'm i'm i need to apologize and i need to not do it again that's repentance the wicked don't like tony just said they don't that's not in them you can't draw something out of somebody if it's not in them. So here's an example of forgiveness toward an unrepentant, wicked man. Excuse me. And we find this example in the Old Testament in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 25 I, I don't have I don't have time to go over this whole chap, chapter and this entire story but I'll give you a summation of it David it's, th this story involves King David before he was king this is David as he's trying to hide from Saul who is king of Israel at the time and Saul is out to kill David. Well, David and his, the army under him, David and his men were hiding out uh, 
under the how can I put this? They were hiding out at a guy's house named Nabal. Nabal had Nabal is a rich guy. Nabal's a wicked man. In fact, the, the the his name Nabal. I'll try to get this out. I'm having a hard time talking today. Even this guy's name Nabal means wicked. In the Hebrew, his name actually means wicked. Can you imagine naming your kid that? Anyway, David is hang is hiding out on the property of Nabal. Uh, apparently, Nabal is a rancher. He raises uh, sheep. I'm sure he raises other animals too. But while David is hiding out on Nabal's property, and Nabal is fully aware of this, David is doing all the work tending to this guy's sheep. He's taking care of his flocks, free of charge. Nabal is fully aware of it. Well, when Nabal finds out that David is essentially a fugitive, he starts saying, he starts slandering David and starts mistreating his men. He literally abuses them. And, and if you want to see what he does to David's men, it's there in chapter 25 of 1 Samuel. I'm not going to go into it. But suffice it to say, Nabal abuses and treats wrongfully David and his men. David catch, catches wind of it. And one could argue whether or not David is right, is, is right in thinking this, but either way, David decides he's going to kill Nabal. David's a warrior. I don't know what Nabal's thinking, abusing David. <laughs> David will hurt you. Yeah. Surely Nabal knew David had been anointed king at this point. He had to have known it. Abigail knew it. We're going to talk about Abigail. His wife knew it. Anointed by God to be king and he's still abusing him. These narcs are something else, aren't they? Brazen. Brazen. Malignant narcissists are just something else. They really are like the pigs we read about in Scripture. We're not supposed to cast our pearls before swine. I'm sure you've, you've heard that or read that. Yeshua made that comment. They can't tell the difference between a pearl and a rotten piece of flesh. Malignant people can't discern the difference between the blessing of God. I'm thinking of Esau and Jacob. They can't discern the value between the blessing of God and a bowl of chunky soup. They disgust me. I want nothing to do with them. I don't care if they're family or not. They treat the things of God this way. They look at holy things this way. The God who redeemed me. The God who was there for me when no one else was. And they treat him like this and his things like this. Why would I want anything to do with them? In fact, they should count themselves blessed that I don't do what David wanted to do with Nabal. Cut his head off. And these people who tell us to forgive them and reconcile with them, 
They don't understand. They don't understand that there's a rage in those of us who've been victimized by these monsters. A rage so strong that there are times, I don't know about you, I can't speak for you, but myself, it would not bother me to meet out vengeance of my own on them. I do think this is a big reason why so many victims of narcissistic abuse fall, it is for me at least, why, and I do, I fall into periods of darkness and depression. It's because of unresolved rage. Do you, am I, do I speak truth, Tony? Okay, 1 Samuel 25. Abigail, Abigail is Nabal's wife. Nabal the wicked. Nabal who has the gall to abuse David. You talk about swine. Okay, Abigail, the wife of Nabal, saw David. David's on his way, by the way, to kill Nabal and just wipe out everything he has. He's going to kill Nabal. He's going to kill Abigail. He's going to kill all of his wives, all of his children. He's going to kill all of his animals. He's going to burn his house down. Have you ever felt that way? Don't lie. <laughs> You ain't David. Yeah. And I'm going to say this to Messiah, Yeshua, is the son of David. You don't want to be on his bad side either. And I'm not talking to you, my followers. I'm talking about the ones who abused us. They don't want to be on his bad side either. David took his character from Yeshua, not the other way around. When Abigail saw David, here comes David. <laughs> He's got his sword drawn. His gun is out of its holster. And when David vows to kill you, you might as well get your house in order. Abigail saw David and she hastened she moved quickly and flew off the donkey she was riding and fell before David, kneeling at his feet and said, Let not my Lord, she's calling him Lord, good thinking, let not my Lord regard this foolish and wicked fellow Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Wicked is his name. And Abigail continued, As the Most High lives, and as your own soul, David, lives, or your own conscience lives, seeing that God has prevented you from avenging yourself with your own hand, make a note of those words, God has prevented you from avenging yourself, committing an act of revenge with your own hand. God prevented him from doing it. Abigail's correct. 
Seeing that God has prevented you from avenging yourself, now let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to you be as Nabal. So Abigail already saw the writing on the wall. Abigail already saw that Nabal is toast. Not at the hands of David, but at the hands of God. David was one of God's little ones. Abigail says to David, When the Lord has done for you according to all that he has promised and has made you the king of Israel, this will not be staggering grief to you. In other words, what you were what you had purposed to do, what you were planning on doing was taking matters in your own hands and avenging yourself. This will not be a staggering grief to you or be a cause for pangs of conscience to you. You will not experience the pain of conscience for avenging yourself. That's what Abigail, that's what Abigail told David. This will not be a burden on your conscience. David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me and to stop me from taking vengeance on the ball with my own hand. Because David knew Abigail was right. Taking out vengeance and revenge on those who harm us violates violates the will of God and it also I want to say it violates our conscience yes but it also is cause for deep pain and sorrow in our inner being in our conscience there 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 is no justification before God there is no moral justification to seek revenge on those who abused you with your own hand if you can do it through legal means you you have moral authority to do that if you can if you can go through the proper channels in fact in some way if you can if you can do it safely in most cases I dare say you can't most malignant narcissists seem to be pretty well connected that I've that I'm aware of And yes, you have every moral right to self-preservation. But we do not have a moral right to execute justice or judgment on others. And there's a reason for that. One reason is it lowers us. It causes us to drop in moral stature, if you will to their level that's what defines a narcissist they believe they have a right to execute justice in their own mind their personal sense of justice but either way they believe they have every right to harm another person and I believe God wants our conscience to be clear and clean of that type of attitude this what I just read to you this exchange between Abigail and David is what our moral leaders should have told us 
They should have clarified to us when they instructed us to forgive our abusers. They should have told us, refrain from vengeance. Uh, exercise some faith that God himself will mete out the right justice on your behalf for those people. But you leave it alone. You do what you can do. You do what you have to do to protect yourself. You value your own soul. You value your own conscience enough not to seek revenge. Do it for the sake of your conscience. And if only our moral leaders would have explained to us that this is the scriptural way to forgive a wicked person who will not repent, will never repent, and indeed cannot repent. That isn't what I was told, though. And even when I wasn't told, this isn't the pressure I felt on me to be at peace and harmony and reconciled with those who could put on the front. They could put, they could put on the mask of parent. They could wear the mask of a husband or a wife or a child or a parent, but they were not. They were wicked. They treated our spirits, our souls, and our bodies shamefully and wickedly, consistently so. And to tell a victim of abuse like that to reconcile, to be at peace with them, to be an example for them is abominable. I would call that reconcil reconciliatory forgiveness. Reconciliatory forgiveness. Which is the type of forgiveness we are under obligation to do when someone who has wronged us has earnestly and sincerely expressed sorrow and is trying to repent. I remember Jesus told one of his disciples, if someone wrongs you and they repent of it seven times, seventy times, forgive them. Or yeah, unfortunately, that verse is abused. But malignant narcissists don't even say we're sorry, though. They don't even say sorry. They don't even acknowledge <laughs> the wrongdoing they do. So... The, I would call this, I, I just, I don't know if this is a real term or not. It's one that I personally coined just for the purposes of my own thinking. And I did a lesson on this a few years ago, and honestly, I can't remember the term I used for that lesson. A lesson called The Two Kinds of Forgiveness. I, I could go back and look, but... I didn't. But I would call this experimentally, what did I say it? Well, experimental forgiveness. No, that isn't it. Determinative forgiveness. I'm sorry. Determinative forgiveness. I'm kind of tired right now. Forgive me. Been a long week. Experiment, uh, determinative forgiveness, which is I. This is the forgiveness that David exercised uh, due to the pleadings of Abigail. This is the type of forgiveness David exercised toward Nabal. 
He left vengeance in the hands of God. He left Nabal alone. He quietly, in disgust probably, but he quietly walked away from Nabal. Determinative forgiveness I would call or I would define as the forgiveness in which you settle in your own heart and in your own mind that as an act of obedience to God you determine this this will not happen naturally you're not gonna feel like doing this But as an act of your will, as an act of my will, I determine to leave vengeance and retribution uh, into the hand, in the hands of God as an act of obedience to God and also in honor and in respect and in reverence to my own inner being, my own conscience. to keep my own conscience clear and sound I refrain from exercising retribution on my enemy I forgive them I don't reconcile with them I don't pray for them I don't have anything to do with them they're wicked they despise the things that I hold dear they have contempt for the things that I hold precious We're not the same kind. They're darkness. I'm light. There's no reconciliation there. So if I'm under pressure to forgive in a reconciliatory way, um, I need to tell the source of that pressure to go away you are telling me to do something that violates my own conscience and that leads me to something else if you'll permit me to talk about this let me find that verse 2nd Corinthians 5 11 this is an amplified classic 2 Corinthians 5.11 Paul writes the Corinthians and says, What sort of persons we are is plainly recognized and thoroughly understood by God. God knows what kind of people we are. I also hope that the kind of persons we are is recognized and understood by your conscience not consciousness conscience and the Amplified reads this your inborn discernment 2nd Corinthians 5:11 in the Amplified classic calls our conscience our inborn discernment Our conscience not only judges our own behaviors and thoughts and attitudes and purposes. This is why I want to keep my conscience clean. My conscience is also my inborn discernment faculty. I discern what sort of people I'm dealing with with my conscience 
I discern the kind of fruit and what kind of tree is producing that fruit with my conscience. I know what sort of person. I recognize what sort or what kind or what classification of person I'm dealing with through the faculty of my conscience. But all the stories, I, see, I never went to church counseling. I at least had that much sense. And I'm not dogging people who did either. No, no, I'm not dogging them at all. But I'm thankful I did not. But these counselors, these moral authorities that tell people what to do without even inquiring of them first, what is your conscience telling you to do? Has anyone ever asked you that? Any counselor? Any advisor? Did anyone ever ask you, Hey, Tony, uh, before I counsel you on the direction you could take, let me ask you, what is your inborn discernment telling you? Did anyone ever tell you that? No. I was never counseled that way or advised that way. Of course, you know... I've never heard of anyone counseled that way. We're the first question. What's your conscience telling you? And if they know what their conscience is telling them to do, a lot of times we don't. There's so many different ideas, you know, filling our head because we're trying to do the right thing under God, that it's hard to connect to our inborn discernment and see what our conscience is attempting to communicate to our consciousness. But that, to me, that would be the first thing I would ask anybody. Can you recognize what your conscience is attempting to communicate with you and how to deal with this person? Is your conscience telling you, revealing to you, what sort of person you're dealing with? And if your conscience is communicating to you, this person is wicked and evil and malignant, you already know what to do. According to Scripture, you already know what to do. Because verse after verse after verse after verse tells you, you need to cut them off. And I want to qualify that by saying if you are unable to cut them off physically, at least spiritually and mentally, cut them off. Don't internalize what they're telling you or doing to you. Don't internalize it. Don't receive it. It's falsehood. The wicked, the malignant, their illusions. The part of the malignant that appears to, you know, care and, and be rep repentant and promises you to change, if you get to that point, even most of them you can't even get to that point with. It's all an illusion. Any goodness, that's what I'm trying to say, any, quote, goodness you see coming from a malignant person is bunk. Am I making sense? Am I okay? Okay. I think I'm going to stop here. Um, two kinds of forgiveness. 
One kind is for people who actually do repent. One type of forgiveness is for someone who is what we call an empath. A person who does have a conscience. Who, who missed it when they treated you wrong. And that is... Rec- uh, Reconciliatory forgiveness. I have a hard time with that. For those who do genuinely repent. And the type of forgiveness for those who do not repent and will not repent is determinative forgiveness. The type of forgiveness where you settle in your heart to leave vengeance in the hands of God. For the sake of your conscience. Amen. Thank you.